waiting for my slides, but thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, so let me stipulate at the outset uh, that you all know more about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence than I do. So my role here is to talk about uh, potential implications and particularly labor market implications. I, I'm a labor economist by training. I focus a lot on jobs, skills, opportunity, uh, inequality, economic mobility. And the question I want to talk about is, will the future take care of us itself? Do we need to worry about any of the things about which many people are worried? Um, and let me say, just uh, because I was asked, the MIT Work of the Future Task Force was set up by the president of MIT, Raphael Reif, uh, and it's an interdisciplinary group to look at the question of, uh, you know, what is happening now technologically? How different is it? Uh, how consequential is that for employment, for jobs? That's why we are called Work of the Future. By the way, notice, not future of work. That seems to raise a question about whether there is a future of work. We believe there is a future of work. We want to talk about that work will be what will be in the future. And ask what are the challenges that's going to create and what are, what are the policies that can uh, address those challenges and maximize opportunities. That's where we're going. But let me uh, start off by just observing uh, that if you think about um, right, you know, many of the great innovations of the last two centuries, they were specifically designed to replace human labor. So the tractor was designed to replace animal and human muscle power with uh, internal combustion engines. The assembly line was designed to remove time-consuming, slow artisanal labor and replace it with uh, machine precision. Uh, the digital computer was built to eliminate the need for cumbersome, error-prone human calculation and replace it with digital perfection. And these technologies, by and large, have been incredibly successful. Uh, they have displaced an enormous amount of human labor, right? So we no longer dig ditches by hand. We don't, you know, pound tools out of wrought iron. Uh, we don't do bookkeeping using books. All of these things are now done for us by machines. And so they have substituted enormously for labor-intensive tasks that used to be comprise a lot of employment. Uh, and yet, over that same period, in general, in the U.S. and in most advanced economies, the share of adults working in the paid labor force has risen, not fallen, over, over the course of uh, over almost every decade of the last 130 years. And you might say, well, you know, how is that even possible? Where do those people come from? Well, a lot of that, of course, reflects the entry of women into the paid labor force. And that means out of, you know, uh, constrictive, uh, potential, you know, uh, constrictive and in many cases uh, tedious work and into more creative activities. So uh, even as we have created all of this automation of work, we seem to have found a way for more people to be working. So the question that I want to talk about today, there's actually four of them. The first is, why are there still so many jobs? Why haven't we actually put ourselves out of work already with all of the innovations that we have created? Secondly, uh, if we're not, if we haven't put ourselves out of work so far, is there anything to worry about? People spend a lot of time concerned about this question. Um, and I'm going to say, yes, there are things to worry about, although uh, running out of work is not actually one of them. Third, um, I want to talk about new work and where does new work come from? Because that's a really important part of the story. I'm going to give a partial answer to that question, and you'll hear more on that later today. Um, and finally, I want to ask, uh, will the future take care of itself? If, if, if there are things to be concerned about, uh, is there anything we should do about that at present? So let me begin. So let me give you a two-part answer to the simple question of why are there still so many jobs? So the first answer I'm going to give is complementarity. Um, let me, that's an economic term, but let me, let me make it much more concrete. So this is a figure from a well-known uh, paper by James Besson, who's an economic historian at Boston University. And uh, he shows that in the kind of the 40 years since the introduction of the automated teller machine, you know, those vending machines that dispense cash, uh, the number of bank tellers in the United States approximately doubled from kind of 1970 to 2000, so from about a quarter million to a half million. That's not an increase as a share of all employment, but numerically they increased. And so that kind of raises the immediate question, like what are all those bank tellers doing? Like why weren't they eliminated by the ATM? Well, this story is, kind of has three parts to it. So just like you would expect, uh, when ATMs were introduced, uh, branches reduced the number of tellers. They didn't need as many because they had machines doing the work. And so the number of tellers per branch uh, fell by about a third. But then banks simultaneously discovered, hey, look, we can open branches much more cheaply with a couple machines and a couple tellers. And so they started branching more aggressively. So many more branches opened. And that had the effect of increasing the number of tellers. That's the second point. 
But that is actually an oversimplification of the story because it wasn't just that there were more tellers or the same number in different places. They're actually doing different work. As the ATMs kind of took over the routine cash handling part of their job, their work shifted to much more of uh, forming relationships with customers, answering questions, solving problems, and introducing them to stuff like you know investments uh, and loans uh, and new forms of accounts. So their work became more cognitively demanding, more interpersonally demanding, and less routine. And this example, although no mean, by no means the only uh, you know, thing that could have happened, illustrates a general principle, which is that most work involves a kind of a range of tasks, right? From the kind of routine to the cognitively intensive, from you know, inspiration, perspiration, from the you know, sublime to the ridiculous. And uh, as you automate some subset of those tasks, assuming the remainder still need to be done, it actually increases the value of what remains, right? So in economic terms, they're complements. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do, if all of them need to be done and one set becomes cheaper and faster, the value of doing the remaining tasks also rises. So as you get good at cash handling, the other part of the bank interaction becomes more important. This is complementarity, and there, you can give many extreme examples of it. I won't, I won't take time on this today, but there's a famous paper by Michael Kramer, an economist at Harvard. Michael won the, the Nobel Prize in Economics in November called the O-Ring Theory of Development. And it basically gives the, the idea that many tasks are, many, many activities are connected and they intimately depend upon one another. And so as you increase productivity and reliability in some subset of them, those that remain become more valuable. The O-Ring, of course, he was speaking of was actually the failed O-Ring that brought down the US Space Shuttle Challenger uh, in, uh, in uh, 1996. And, uh, and the point that he was making in that example was that in this multi-decade, multi-billion year dollar enterprise, the only thing that went wrong was this tiny single part. And in some sense, that could only be true if everything else worked properly. The reason that was so valuable is exactly because everything else worked. And so the point is, in, many, in much of the work that we do, whether you are teaching a class or diagnosing a patient or designing a building, uh, the work that we do Provides, provides this central role, this O-ring role. Our judgment, our creativity, our expertise uh, have incredibly high leverage in a world where uh, we have so much power and automation and scope at our fingertips. So in many, many ways, even as we automate a set of activities, we complement the human labor that remains. But the human labor is doing something different. It is using expertise, meaning a body of knowledge that's acquired. It is applying judgment. So it's not enough to have a body of knowledge. You need to know when it's relevant, what case law to use in a legal argument, uh, what diagnosis is appropriate for a patient. Um, and then it uses creativity, which means taking expertise and judgment from one domain and applying it to another to provide a novel solution. All of those things become more valuable as we automate away the kind of routine or uh, you know, rote part of our work. So, that answers half the question. It says, well, what type of work people will do? But it doesn't tell you how much of it will there be. And it seems kind of self-evident that as we become more productive at something, we eventually would automate ourselves out of a job. So you can see that, for example, in agriculture. Uh, in 1900, 40% uh, of all US employment was on farms. Uh, in 2000, uh, that was under 2%. And, and that's not because Americans are eating less. Uh, and it's not because we're importing food from China. Uh, actually, the U.S. is a huge food exporter. This reflects a century of productivity growth of technology in irrigation, in genetics, uh, in fertilization, in mechanization. And so, you know, we now have a situation where a couple million farmers can feed a population of 320 million and export a lot of food. So that's incredible progress. But it's also pretty clear there are only so many O-ring jobs left in farming, right? A lot of it has been automated away. Um, however, and, and so I should say that, you know, that's not a, uh, an exceptional example. There are many sectors that you can point to that, at, you know, when productivity rises, at first they grow and then they shrink because they use so much labor. But what is true at the level of a single industry or a single sector activity has never been true at the level of, an, of the aggregate economy. Uh, as we become more productive and as incomes rise, we invent new activities and services that, that demand income, uh, that occupy our time and our attention, our creativity, and that use labor. So many of the things that people spend their money on, 
you know, air conditioning, you know, consumer electronics, sport utility vehicles, you know, had not been invented 100 years ago or were impossibly expensive. Many of the sectors in which people work, you know, finance, uh, medicine and healthcare, uh, you know, in information technology and information design were also were minute or non-existent a century ago, right? So if you had asked a farmer, you know, in 1900, hey, guess what? The agricultural employment share is gonna fall from 40% to 2% over the course of a century. What do you suppose the other, you know, 38% of the population will do for a living, right? You, you could have heard one of two answers. You know, one answer would be, you know, oh, you know, we'll, I guess there'll be 38% unemployment. That would have been one answer. Uh, another might have been, well, I guess they'll just do the, the remaining set of things, like more people will be doing them. You know, more people will be working in the general store. More people will be working on the railroad, um, et cetera. In fact, neither of those would be the correct answer. Because as I'll talk about in a few minutes, it's not just that we do a narrower set of things more efficiently. We do a broader set of things, but they're different. And it would have been hard to imagine and anticipate what those things would have been uh, with foresight. And even now, today, it is hard for us, certainly hard for me, to imagine what those things will be 100 years from now. I have confidence they will be, but I couldn't tell you exactly what they will be. Okay, so, so if you buy my argument, and some of you may not, uh, you, you might come away saying, okay, look, there's going to be jobs, right? B because of the you know, complementarity, because of insatiability, meaning the fact that as we get more affluent, we find more things to do, um, there will be enough work. Uh, and I think that's, I think I feel confident saying that. So does that mean there's nothing to worry about? Like all good, problem solved, uh, we're done, <laughs> go home. Um, I would say not. Uh, so there are several things that you might uh, want to worry about. So let me first start with the case that we shouldn't worry. So here's The Economist magazine, influential to me, um, uh, you know, in May of last year, saying, look, across the rich world, an extraordinary jobs boom is underway. Uh, the zeitgeist has lost touch, lost touch with the data. The strength of the labor market calls into question gloomy predictions about the future of work. So The Economist is all in, nothing to worry about, go home. Um, the task force that I uh, lead at MIT says, uh, actually, you should worry. <laughs> uh, it says, look, public concern is neither ill-informed nor misguided. Um, there's lots of evidence that technological progress will deliver rising productivity. And rising productivity ultimately means rising wealth for someone. Um, but there's no certainty that the fruits of this bounty will reach the typical worker. And we can see lots of evidence for exactly that uh, if we look in the last four decades of data. So for example, in the United States, this shows you the path of aggregate productivity growth and earnings on average and at the median from uh, the end of the Second World War to roughly the present. From the, from the first three decades after the end of World War II, productivity growth rose very steeply and average incomes rose uh, you know, in lockstep, as is the median income. Just so, just so we're clear, the average puts you know, uh, you know, sums up and divides by n. The median, of course, just ranks people from lowest to highest, and the median and the average both moved in lockstep with productivity growth. After approximately the mid 1970s, early 1980s, productivity growth slowed down. That's well known, but didn't slow down that much. But what really changed was that that productivity growth did not translate into any increase in the median income. So the average rose because some people got a lot, but the median did not. So we can see that's a, you know, a perfect example that you can have lots of you know, wealth, lots of riches coming from technology, from technological progress, and yet not have a lot of shared prosperity. So we should not count, we should not assume that progress lead, you know, a, you know, in terms of wealth leads to, leads to progress in terms of societal distribution or allocation. Uh, and in fact, uh, in many countries, again, the U.S. being a leading example, and I don't mean in a positive sense, uh, we have a, a surge of inequality. Uh, this shows you the path of earnings uh, for people of five education groups from 1963 to approximately the present. So just from the bottom to top, uh, high school dropouts, high school graduates, some college, college graduate, and greater than college. And you can see that for essentially from 1980 forward, they have fanned out enormously and quite remarkably among less educated U.S. men in particular, earnings now per hour are lower than they were almost 40 years ago. That is remarkable and not in a good sense of the word. Um, so, uh, so that's a second concern, right? And it's related to the first, this kind of maldistribution of income, as I would say. Um, a third is that uh, we increasingly see uh, that, uh, that the share of all national income paid to labor 
is actually falling. So from most of the 20th century, about 70 cents of every dollar or 70% of every amount of income that was added by, was added value by corporations was paid to workers with the other 30% paid to capital, meaning owners of stock, owners of machines and so on. That percentage has fallen by maybe 5%, so from 70 to 65 in many advanced countries since about the year 2000. Now you might say, well, what's, what's problematic about that? You know, ultimately the money is paid to someone, right? It's not paid physically to the machines, it's paid to the owners of the machines. So ultimately the income is distributed to people. However, ownership of capital is far, far more concentrated than ownership of labor, right? Most people own some labor, i.e. their own, and they can sell it to the market. Uh, most people do not own capital, and that you know, has always been true and probably mostly will be true. And so that reallocation actually uh, leads to further income concentration. And I would argue, and this is a longer discussion that I won't go into today, that that, that doesn't just reflect a technological inevitability, but also a distortion that is created by our tax codes that heavily subsidize the investment in capital relative to labor at the margin. So a firm saying like, look, should I automate this process? Well. I could pay a million dollars per year for workers. I could pay a million dollars a year for machines to do this thing. Oh, look, the government gives me a lower tax rate on my machines than on my workers. I guess I'll automate that, right? That, that's actually inefficient. That's excessive automation. So we can worry about that. Finally, and this ties much more specifically to the type of automation we're talking about today, about you know, using information technology, one thing that we see in many advanced economies is a kind of a, a polarization of the structure of jobs, um, or what some would call a kind of a barbell economy, where if you look at, if you rank jobs from lowest paid to highest paid, so on the left here are, you know, personal services, health services, food service, cleaning, uh, security. Uh, those, are, uh, those are typically some of the lowest paid and least secure jobs in any modern economy. Um, then you move over into the blue zone. Those are production, operative, clerical, administrative support jobs. Uh, those are often the middle skilled work done by people with high school and some college education. And you can see that those are contracting rapidly. The ones on the far left are growing. And then on the far right are professional, technical, and managerial jobs. These are, you know, highly skilled, interesting, economically secure, creative jobs, presumably jobs that you all have. Um, those are also growing. So this decline of the middle, this polarization, is potentially a problem uh, for on many levels. You know, it, it potentially shrinks the size of the middle class. It kind of knocks out rungs in the economic ladder. Uh, it potentially reduces the, uh, the possibility that people go from rags to riches. Where is that coming from? Well, I think we understand pretty well at this point that many of those middle skill jobs follow well understood rules and procedures that can be described in software and executed by machines, whether on a production line or whether in an office. Uh, and so automation has had a large effect in changing the distribution of jobs, not the number of jobs, but the types of jobs. And not all that is for the better, right? So as this middle has shrunk, people of high levels of education have moved up, especially women, by the way, who have surpassed men in higher education and increasingly moved into the professions. However, for those who don't have high levels of education, the horizons of opportunity are actually shrinking. There's lots and lots of jobs available for people without high levels of education, but there are fewer good careers, careers in which people build skills and expertise over the life cycle, such that their incomes rise and such that their security rises because they're not in direct head-to-head -head competition with the next person who applies for the job because their expertise uh, gives them uh, you know, a, a valuable talent. I should say this is not just in the US. Uh, uh, work by uh, Guzmaning and Solomons shows a similar pattern for the uh, EU countries of the decline in the middle skill, that's the red, and the growth in uh, the high and low skill jobs simultaneously. So let me tie this directly to uh, information technology. So this, this is a, a chart from a recent job paper by um, a PhD candidate paper by Michael Webb at Stanford University. And he actually uses the text of patents uh, uh, to look for verb noun pairs that describe what the patent is trying to do. And so, for example, uh, if you're looking at software patents, they would say something, you know, you know uh, sort, you know, data, uh, perform calculation, look up information. And he then matches those verb noun pairs in patents to verb noun pairs in occupational, uh, occupational descriptors. So you might find an occupation that says, you know, sort numbers, retrieve information, uh, you know, file, duplicate, and so on. 
And then he asks where those patents, if where in the occupational distribution are those patents targeted? In other words, what are the tasks that the, pat that the machines are attempting to do, that are claiming to do, according to the designers, and how do those relate to what people are already doing? And so he lines up occupations according to their wage rank, and then asks how exposed are these occupations to the tasks that the at least people are claiming to be automating in their computer and software patents. And it looks like the inverse of that polarization I showed you, right? Exactly the tasks that were targeted by software automation are the ones that have contracted. In other words, many of the ones that follow these rules and procedures. But of course, that's what already happened. You understand that well, and we've seen those consequences. But what about the things that are happening now? So Web does the same exercise for two other technologies, one being robotics and the other being artificial intelligence. So if we look at robotics, not shockingly, many of the tasks that are targeted by robotics are comparatively lower paid tasks because they're physically dexterous activities, right? They, they use a lot of manual labor, uh, not as much cognitive labor. So many of the, uh, you know, many of the, you know, the stooping, the repetitive motion, eventually even the dexterous, uh, you know, cleaning tasks will eventually done, be done by robotics. And we already see this, by the way, and there's good evidence uh, in, in uh, heavy industry that robotics has already led to a, a big change in the composition of capital and labor. You know, German auto manufacturers will tell you they have more robots than people working on the assembly line in a given time. And, uh, and that will eventually spread, right? But not very fast, in fact. As you all know, robots are hard, right? And the, and the reason robots are hard is because the world is complicated, right? A factory is a very simple place, right? It's designed to be simple. It's designed to be entirely predictable. What makes robotics challenging in the world is that the world has all kinds of unpredictability and the kind of dexterity and the common sense that's needed to move around in the world is enormous. That's why people continue to do that activity. So that's robotics. Now let's finally talk about um, artificial intelligence. That's okay, I'm good, I'm good. The, uh, so, so Webb does the, the same exercise for AI patents. And, uh, and ask where do those target? And the amazing thing is that these are strongly increasing in the wage distribution, meaning that AI tasks at least are targeted at what highly educated people do, up to about the 90th percentile. And uh, you know, just to give you a kind of concrete example, what does that mean? Well, there are many professional tasks that kind of involve a mixture of first following a set of rules and procedures, right? So, gathering data, making some calculations, checking inventory, whatever. And then on top of that, then there's judgment, right? There's a seat of the pants evaluation. So if you're deciding how much of a thing to order for your store, you know, first you look at market demand, you look at the history, you look at the prices, you look at competitors, and then you, you know, check your gut and decide, do I want to go in on this or do I not want to go in on this? Well, historically, that second part of that task was not subject to automation, right? That judgment, that seat of the pants, that kind of collecting a whole bunch of, you know, kind of uh, both hard and soft information and making decision. But now it's at least potentially feasible in the realm of AI, right? So for example, Amazon used to literally have people that ordered stuff for their warehouses. They no longer have that. They stock millions and millions of products, but all of the decision-making is done by software. And that's a mixture of one traditional software that does the rules and procedures, and then AI that makes that judgment. So you might say, look, you know, machines aren't that good at making that judgment but then neither are people, right? We're pretty error prone in this way. So it's possible there will be more substitution. So again, I think we don't know how much, how fast, how consequential, but we do know that that's where the technology is targeting. So what can we say about that? Well, remember that in the years, the hundred years of history that I ascribe to you, even as agriculture declined, people moved into new activities. They moved into industry and they moved into services, but that didn't happen on its own. That was not an automatic process. So in the US, in the farm states, it, where the agriculture was most concentrated, they saw at the turn of the 20th century, they saw things changing. They noticed that agriculture was shrinking because productivity was, they didn't say because productivity was rising, but because technology was getting so good. And they were concerned that their children would be unneeded on the farm and yet not prepared for industry. And so what did they do? They passed laws that said their kids needed to stay in school until age 16. Uh, they passed, they mandated that they go to school. And, and that was a very, that was a big bet, right? Because that was expensive. 
you had to build buildings, you had to hire teachers, you had to buy books, but most importantly, those kids couldn't work on the farm from age 10 forward like they normally would. They had to be in school. So that was incredibly expensive. And uh, looking back, it was probably the best public investment the U.S. made in the 20th century. It gave the U.S. the most flexible, the most uh, skilled, uh, and the most productive workforce in the world. And so adapting to that change was not automatic. It actually came about as part of a deliberate decision in response to the change in the work environment that people were undergoing. So um, we have lots of jobs and jobs are growing, but whether people are prepared for the good jobs is unclear. So let me conclude by talking about new work. And I, I realize I'm uh, uh, past time. Uh, <laughs> So I'll speak quickly. So it's impossible to tell this story without thinking about not just what jobs are going away, but what jobs are coming. And it's hard to say what jobs are coming. So let me give you four, four forces that potentially lead to this. One is what I'm going to call Uber effects or just elastic demand. Just like in the case of bank tellers, we see that if you introduce a better, cheaper product, it may actually increase rather than reduce employment. So if you look at taxi cab trips in New York City, they actually fell from 275,000 to under 300, four, excuse me, they fell by about 40% over the course of three years. But of course, if you look at all ride hailing trips, right, they approximately doubled. And there are actually more people working in, you know, personal transportation in New York now than there were three years earlier. And that's because the product has gotten cheaper and better and more productive, right? Just like the bank tellers. So one of the, one of the effects that drives new work is simply improvements in productivity. A second, of course, is rising incomes. So, you know, in the U.S., we talk a lot about Walmart that, you know, uh, introduces low prices, makes life cheaper. When that happens, you know, you could tell a story, well, price, pr products are cheaper, Therefore, people buy, you don't have to spend much money, and so that would lead to a slowdown. Is that a signal to me? Okay. Uh, but uh, so you could imagine, well, people would just save the money. But it, uh, and in the U.S., for example, the share of all income spent on necessities, by which I mean food, housing, and clothing, has fallen from about 80% to 60% or less over the course of 100 years. So that leaves another 20% of income available. Do people save that income? Well, we're talking about America here, so no, right? Uh, they spend it. They spend it on, you know, uh, things that were not necessities and yet become, seem necessary. <laughs> Larger houses, better vehicles, uh, food out and away and so on. So that actually drives uh, expenditure and drives, uh, and drives employment. Finally, actually, I'm going to skip the third one, just in the interest of time. Let me say that one of the most important ideas here is the invention of entirely new work work that didn't exist before. And so rather than speak about that now, I'm going to uh, turn you over at the end, or I'm going to point you to the talk by Anna Solomons at two o'clock today, uh, where she will be talking specifically about the historical evolution of new work, where it comes from, what it looks like, what skills it demands. So let me just wrap up. Um, so the challenge ahead is not scarcity of jobs. There will be plenty of work to do. But job quantity does not guarantee job quality. And that's what we see in this polarization. Um, moreover, technologies don't guarantee either fast productivity growth or shared prosperity. It depends where we channel them and how we channel both the in investment of, in the technology and the distribution of resources. So I would say three things. One is we overestimate our machines. We think they can do more than they, can, than they actually do. And moreover, we think we give them, uh, uh, a t we, we give them a, 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 we attribute to them the, the driving role, right? Machines show up, we deal with them. We figure out, you know, how to handle that. Um, but of course, that's not right. We underestimate ourselves. We, you, make the decisions about what technologies to invest in, which problems are important, and how to implement those and how those outcomes are shared. So both of these errors lead to complacency, the belief that the future is not in our hands. We just wait here, see what technology shows up, and we deal with it. But that's not true. It's never been true. We play a role of, uh, we, we, in shaping what technologies are designed, what purposes they serve, how they are implemented, and how the benefits are shared. And just like we saw in the case of the movement out of agriculture into industry, that was a successful movement, but not because it happened by itself, but because we made forward-looking investments and choices in that time. So we have a lot of control over this, but the future will not take care of itself. That's your job. Thanks very much.